Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their advice. If you'd like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. Whenever I've thought maybe I can be useful to others if I do this thing or that thing, you know, most of the time I realize that I can much more helpful than I would have ever realized, whether it's something like starting a, a podcast or starting, or starting Autism Personal Coach. That's why I'm thrilled to talk with Purple Ella about her impact on, on so many others as a digital content creator in regards to discussing her autism, ADHD, and chronic illness on social media. We also discuss with Ella about the strategies she has developed in her life to self-regulate. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Ella, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks for inviting me. I, I wanted to start off and just learn where does your story in the autistic community begin? Okay, well, I mean, it kind of begins back when I was a child in that my mom worked as a special needs teacher with autistic children in particular throughout my childhood, so I spent quite a lot of time helping out in her school and also volunteering on summer play schemes and working with autistic children, who I always felt really comfortable around, probably more comfortable than my peers. But I didn't really consider autism as a potential diagnosis for me or anyone in my family until I had my eldest child, who is now 15, which, gosh, makes me feel super old. And when she was really young, when I first started noticing what I knew were the stereotypical traits of autism because of my experience in the past, so... You know, she was lining stuff up and she was showing a great deal of interest in trains. And, you know, at the time, I guess all I really knew were the stereotypes. This knowledge that I had came from the 80s, which is um, a time when people like me weren't being diagnosed with autism. And so eventually she was diagnosed when she was, she was seven or eight. And around that time, I kind of came to realize that I'm also autistic and I was assessed and diagnosed. And I think I'd never really considered it before because, as I said, I only really understood the experience of autism with a co-occurring learning disability, which obviously looks very different to someone like me. But when I went through the process of having my child diagnosed, I recognized so many things in the ways that they were talking about autism in relation to her because she also doesn't have a learning disability and kind of realized that a lot of the challenges that I'd been experiencing could be explained by autism. So once I was diagnosed, I was kind of like, okay, I've lived a really long time not knowing that I'm autistic, and since people weren't being diagnosed with autism when I was a child, that must mean there's actually loads of people like me out there who are autistic and either haven't realized or are just finding out, and maybe it would be useful if I talk about it on the internet and, like, put something out there for people like me because at the time all I was finding were young white cis men talking about autism which obviously wasn't necessarily something I related to so I put out my first YouTube video which was about the diagnostic process in I think it was 2016 about a month after I was diagnosed and the rest is as they say history well you know as you were saying you've been uh, you know talking about it on the internet for a while you're for many years, you've been a digital content creator. You talk about your life regarding autism, ADHD, and chronic illness. So what have been some maybe important things you've learned on your way to maybe to amass such an impressive following that you have up to this point on social media? Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. autism, ADHD, and my experience in general. So when I was first making content, I was really covering some of those stereotypes. I even made a video about theory of mind, which I have actually since taken down. And I was just kind of making content. Like, as I was learning, I was making the content. 
and since then I've obviously made autism and ADHD my special interest and so I've read loads of studies and I've been to loads of conferences and I've read loads of books and I have amassed an amount of knowledge that means that I'm not now just sharing my own experience I'm kind of sharing a more like holistic view which takes into account my own experience but also the experiences of people I've met and the stuff that I've learned along the way which hopefully means that my content has more nuance and is hopefully more useful and I've also learned that putting yourself on the internet and a place where you know value is placed on likes subscribers and clicks isn't necessarily all that healthy for someone who's lived with self-esteem issues all their life and so I've had to learn a lot about kind of coping with that well I, I know a lot lots and lots and lots of people have found your content useful but not just people, uh, companies as well. I know you've worked with uh, many different companies, companies like Prime Video and GoPuff, just to name a, a few examples. How did you go about developing these relationships? Did they reach out to you because of all the great content you're providing, or did you connect with them in other ways? Well, thus far, I have never reached out for sponsored content work because in the early years I guess I didn't have enough of a following really and then since that grew I had to navigate I think what can be quite uncomfortable for a lot of creators particularly creators who are kind of out there trying to do good in the world like balancing that with promoting stuff is a really <laughs> tricky path especially when you're potentially promoting stuff to an audience who are maybe vulnerable, particularly people with ADHD, to kind of spending money impulsively. Or if I put something out there and I say, I think this is a good thing, I am potentially encouraging people to spend money on something. And so it's that's a, like, is that the right thing to do? That was the first kind of hurdle. So I haven't reached out for that kind of work because I didn't want to deal with it. But nonetheless, some companies did approach me and ask me to do sponsored content. And I don't know how they find me. I do always wonder that when I get lots of emails about lots of different kinds of work and kind of always think, I mean, yeah, where does that come from? But I'm also in a position now where I'm feeling like, you know what, I've made like, what, 200 and something videos on YouTube and loads more on Instagram and made like very, very little from it. So it's reached the point where the workload is big enough that I do need to do some of that sponsored work in order to pay my pay for it to work, to make it a sustainable business. So I'm probably going to be doing, continuing to do that kind of work and maybe even be looking for it. Oh, I don't know. You can probably tell how uncomfortable I am about it from the way I'm speaking about it. It's hard. It is hard. When you're creative, like, there is that, that kind of balance. Yeah. So I think... I think I would never, ever promote something that I thought was actively harmful, absolutely. And I would never promote something I don't, that I absolutely wouldn't use. But I might be slightly more enthusiastic about something than I otherwise would be if it's going to pay for my food that week. Okay, understand. Now, like you said, you've created so many videos. We could take this conversation in so many different ways. But you know, recently, you created some content that really kind of spoke to me in terms of getting into a better rhythm and flow and having mini routines to better regulate yourself, which I think is so important to myself and so many others. So before we get into some of those things you've done that have been helpful, can you talk about when you don't have those routines, how does that impact your life? Yeah, well, I think, I don't know, maybe you're in the same position. When you're a creative who generally works from home, it's quite easy to keep those rhythms going. But recently, I've started to be asked to do more exciting work that's outside of the home and that's on other people's terms. So I've had some experience of that. How do I make my life work now in a different context? And the result of me not being able to run my life with those rhythms and those rest periods is essentially panic attacks, overload, burnout, anxiety, and very little sleep. So I've kind of come to realize that it's not worth pushing myself too far in the name of, but I'm helping people if it means that I'm going to be broken at the end of it and I'm, I'm unable to help anyone. Now, I, I know a lot of people have been given advice like, oh, you need to have a better schedule. And it's like, yeah, easy for you to say. But um, I'm interested in mini routines. How many of those do you kind of have throughout your day? At the moment, I've got three like definite mini routines. I'd actually like to add more. So I would say my main ones at the moment are my morning routine, which I've been running for about five years now. It's been adjusted, but it's essentially 
a routine that gets me from <laughs> lying in bed with a whole day ahead of me, like, oh my goodness, what, to being dressed and ready to work. And that's really helpful. And then I've got kind of a lunchtime routine, which is more recent, when I realised that actually I can't start working at half eight in the morning and stuff at five o'clock without taking any breaks. So I've got a lunchtime routine, which means that not only do I eat lunch, but I also spend some time reading for fun and hanging out with my service dog. And then I've got an evening routine that takes me from the working day into my relaxation time and time with my special interests. Now, one interesting thing that you've talked about is how stoicism has been helpful to you, which is essentially, at least in my interpretation, about how you're living your life and what values are important to you. So what would you say are the values that are really important to you in your life? Okay, so this is a bit of a tricky one because I had a little bit of a fallout with my stoic journal this morning. (laughs) <laughs> because it asked me if I was going to seize the day, and I was like, no, not really clearly to seize the day today. So I would say that anything I'm going to say about stoicism comes with a side helping of how I've adjusted it for my neurotypical brain, because stoicism can be quite black and white, and it can be quite you can control your mind, which mm. I don't believe to be true. But essentially, the main philosophies that I've found helpful are, one, that we are in charge of our own impact on the world what we value what we choose to value so it can feel at the moment particularly with the world in the chaos of a pandemic and an environmental crisis and a war in you know in in ukraine it can feel and that's not even getting started on you know the abuse of minority groups and it can feel like there's so many problems in the world and i want to fix them all and i feel completely overwhelmed and so i'm ineffective to help anyone and stoicism kind of suggests that you stay in your own lane. And that's not to say that you support other, don't support other people on their own causes, but that you choose the things that are most important to you and you focus on those things. So for me, that's helping disabled and autistic people, which has been useful because otherwise I'm like a bit of a professional protester and I'd just be out there trying to fix everything. And it also talks about like kind of valuing good thoughts and good actions over wealth and fame and it talks about valuing action over philosophy and you know like rather than being someone who's on the internet going this is what you should believe actually living a life that demonstrates those beliefs right Mm -hmm. yeah makes a lot of sense in watching some of your videos recent videos it seems that something that maybe has uh, I don't know if you would call it a special interest but at least it seems like it in terms of watching the videos is uh, drinking tea tea yes <laughs> so i i drink tea every week but i'd like to kind of get into it a little bit more do you have any great uh tea suggestions oh my gosh i've gone so deep on tea you know in full transparency i was dealing with a tobacco addiction which was a result of being someone who has adhd we commonly fall into addictions and i didn't know until i was in my 40s so i had an addiction that i used as a maladjusted strategy and I've tried for a really long time to find something to replace that so that I could move on. I never found anything until I discovered tea. Like, because you can break up your day with tea, you can celebrate with tea, you can feel sad with tea. It's just, it's so great. So in terms of recommendations, I've been really digging matcha, which is like, the, it's the leaves finely ground of the green tea, of green tea. It's like the finest green tea ground up, so you're actually drinking it rather than just stewing the leaves. And there's a lot of theories that it could help with anxiety because of the impact that matcha tea has, has on dopamine and serotonin and you know if you want to hear more about that I you know ask me I do talk about matcha a lot and then I'm also really digging teas that kind of help with different moods so like chamomile tea if you're anxious and mint tea if you feel a little bit unsettled or nauseous so I've basically got this box of a bunch of different kinds of tea tea for every occasion so it depends what like what is your what are your favorite flavors I- like that's a question. I'm, I'm turning it around. I'm hosting now. What oh, no. Okay. Now? All right. What am I... I have learned very recently for what, that I'm very much into things that taste like orange. Orange tea. Okay. So, okay. so I don't... There's, yeah. There's a blend that I've got that I'm actually not that keen on, but sounds like it would be right up your street. A company called Bird and Blend. So I think they do post it. I'm hearing... Are you in the States? I am in the States, yes. I think they do post out there. And it's literally called Bears Like Marmalade. Okay. And it is the orangest tea I have ever drunk. Like, it's too intensely orange for me. So maybe it would be right up your street. <laughs> well, that is, that is great to know. I, tea has kind of overwhelmed me at times because I... 
I almost look at it as like an executive functioning thing where there's so many choices. Like, how do you go about deciding like which tea is for you? Yeah, well, you could. What I kind of like about tea is going back to that like mini routines and rhythms thing is that making, so I have a pot and I use loose leaf tea and making a pot of tea is like its own little mini rhythm that you can be like, right, it's time for a break now. Let's yeah. go into tea routine. So maybe you could assign different, so I probably drink four cups a day. Maybe you could assign different teas to different points of the day so there's no decision making required. Well, you're going to inspire me after our conversation to put on a pot of tea, that's for sure. Nice. <laughs> so I think having a rhythm and flow can be helpful in many ways to the neurodivergent experience. However, probably one way I think it can be really beneficial is in regards to transitions. Are there any particular transitions in your life that's really essential to have this rhythm and flow? Otherwise, you'll, you know, if you don't have it, you'll become dysregulated? Yeah, absolutely the morning one. Like, I don't seem to be very good at mornings. I have a tendency to cry and have first thing in the morning meltdowns, which is really challenging. And if I try and do any, like, processing in the morning, I really struggle with that. So having like a definite plan for what I'm going to do for at least half an hour or so before I have to think and or even speak to anyone really helps prevent that from happening. And then the next one I find really challenging is moving from work into leisure time. Like I think especially because I work on social media, I have a tendency to stop my official work, sit down and start scrolling social media which is kind of also work, so isn't transitioning, isn't good for my brain, and isn't helping reduce overload. So at the moment, I'm really trying to work on that routine so that I can have a rhythm at that point in the day that prevents me from falling down a TikTok hole, I suppose, essentially. Yeah. Which essentially leads to, like, that fight-or-flight, high-adrenaline anxiety feeling, which en ends with panic attack. I think a lot of people can identify with those two specific you know, transitions, you know, starting off with the panic of the day. And then I don't know, for me, just being able to, like, do leisure is sometimes a struggle. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. I think that's like a really misunderstood thing, particularly if you have comorbid ADHD. But either way, if you've got exact function skills, like, there's this knowledge, isn't there, that autistic people have, like, special interests, right? And that we can engage in them for hours and they're really good for us. And that is true. But getting into that special interest and not being distracted by a million other things is actually quite difficult. And so you can end up feeling like, A, I'm failing at being an autistic person because I didn't spend two hours doing my special interest today. And B, like, I don't feel like I've gotten the, the thing that I need from that because I didn't do it because I couldn't concentrate or get myself into the right place to do it yeah now it's really hard. yeah now having a great rhythm and flow throughout um one's day is i think s certainly helpful but even so i think i'm still prone to having more shutdowns than probably at what i would admit and usually it's when i pick up on negative emotions um, within myself or others are there any ways you found to be helpful um, in regulating um, your emotions? Yes, that's been my like work of the last six months because I am really emotionally dysregulated in general, which probably people would find hard to believe given my I've got it all together social media content. Oh, hopefully that's not what I'm doing anyway, but yeah, I, I am very emotionally dysregulated, so I have been focusing on that. And I think part of the emotional dysregulation is an autism thing. But I also think part of that is related to trauma, because I've kind of recently come to realise that a lot of autistic people are carrying trauma, because a lot of autistic people have been bullied, have been judged, have been ostracised. And as a result of that, we are carrying trauma. That means that when something happens that takes us back to that place of feeling ostracised, rejected and wrong, we have a trauma response and our emotions become dysregulated. And added into that, many of us have a hard time identifying emotions. And many of us are scared of emotions. So I know that for me, that what that would look like is be triggered, have emotion, not know how to deal with it, try to fix it, make emotion worse, lose my rag, feel bad about losing my rag, 
and repeat, right? Yeah. And so what I'm learning to do is to kind of break that cycle, firstly by recognizing what those triggers are and how those triggers make me feel so that I can go, oh, I'm being triggered. This is an emotion that's related to that. And then secondly, by like facing the lion, if you like. So rather than going, oh gosh, I've got an emotion, I must do something about it. Going, okay, I've got an emotion. I'm going to sit with that emotion. I'm not going to die. Nothing bad's going to happen. I'm just going to be feeling this emotion. And through doing that, it's kind of reduced the bigness of emotions. Like you sit with them and they do kind of just go away. And you can end up feeling a little bit silly when you sit with them because you're like, oh, this is terrible. Life is terrible. Everything's all right. Everything's terrible. I'm going to lie on my bed. Nothing will ever be good again. Then half an hour later, you kind of find yourself feeling yourself up going, oh, I appear to still be functioning. <laughs> okay, as you were, everything's fine. Carry on with your day. You know. So my tip would be, Try not doing anything and see what happens. Just let it kind of process. Yeah, yeah, let it be. We are humans, we will feel emotions, and the more fear we take out of that process, the easier they are to bear, really. Put on the Beatles, listen to Let It Be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, lastly, if people aren't viewing your content online, how can they go about doing so? Oh, well, if you're not, you definitely should, because um, that would be great for me. So you can find me on YouTube as Purple Ella, where, as I've said, there are over 200 videos. I don't think there's a topic you can think of that I haven't talked about. You can also find me on TikTok at Purple Ella and Coco, on Instagram also at Purple Ella and Coco. If you really, really need a little bit more Ella in your life, I can occasionally be found ranting on Twitter at Purple Ella. You're easy to find. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, Ella, it was uh, wonderful to uh, talk with you. Thanks so much for making time for me today. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much to Ella for the conversation. To learn more about Ella, check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. You know, I really enjoyed hearing Ella talk about the strategies she's developed, probably through a lot of trial and error, to regulate herself in her life. With Autism Personal Coach, we're often helping people to better regulate themselves. And it's very individualized as what works for one person may certainly not work for another. So maybe stoicism or drinking tea may not help you like it does for Ella. However, with our coaching, we can help you figure out what works best for you. If you're interested in learning more about how Autism Personal Coach can help you to better self-regulate, then please book a free call with me today. A link for the free call can be found in the podcast description of this episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.